This short course presented by the Clinical Education Department will be focusing on OASIS accuracy with regards to two specific OASIS areas, pain and dyspnea. The objectives for this course are for an individual to demonstrate understanding of the basic conventions of the pain and dyspnea OASIS questions and for individuals to be able to accurately score the pain and dyspnea OASIS questions. Let's first start by discussing the OASIS items regarding pain. There are two OASIS questions that inquire about pain. Remember, the OASIS questions are only a component of a comprehensive pain assessment. Your physical assessment of the patient will collect more specific information about pain that your patient may be experiencing. The first OASIS question we have about pain is regarding how we assess the patient for their pain. This is M1240. M1240 will occur at start of care and resumption of care. This question is utilized for quality and risk adjustment. The second OASIS question we have is about the frequency at which pain occurs. This is M1242. This question will appear at start of care, resumption of care, follow up, and discharge. This question is utilized for Medicare payment quality, and risk adjustment. M1240 asks if the patient had a formal pain assessment completed utilizing a standardized pain assessment tool. Again, this question will only appear at start of care and resumption of care, and we should be utilizing a standardized pain assessment tool at those time points. We have three response options for this question, a zero, a one, and a two. A zero indicates no standardized assessment tool was conducted, which should be avoided considering you have multiple options for pain assessment tools that can be utilized with your patients. A one indicates that a standardized tool was utilized and it does not indicate severe pain. A two indicates that a standardized tool was utilized and it does indicate severe pain. There are five standardized pain assessment tools that can be utilized in our home care home-based system. They include the numerical scale, the checklist of nonverbals, the FLACC, the Wong Baker, and the pain ad. The numerical scale is a 0 to 10 scale where a 0 equals no pain and a 10 equals the worst imaginable pain. In order for this tool to be valid, the patient must have normal cognition and language skills. A score of 6 or higher indicates severe pain. The second scale is the Wong-Baker scale. This is also commonly called the face's pain scale. The patient is shown several pictures and chooses the face that best represents their pain. If they choose a face that correlates with a six or higher, then they are considered to have severe pain. The faces are not built into the home care home based system. You would need to utilize either a printed copy of the faces or your internet app in order to show the patient the figures. The checklist of nonverbal pain indicators is a tool that can be utilized when a patient does not have normal cognition or is unable to express themselves. This tool has no official cutoff for severe pain. If the patient has any signs of pain with movement or at rest, they will be scored as having pain. The total score will be calculated by the tablet. The Pain Assessment in Advanced Dementia, or pain Ad scale, is a tool that can be used with patients who have dementia or difficulty expressing themselves. The pain Ad is scored based on observation of the patient. The tablet will calculate the total pain score, and a score of 6 or higher indicates severe pain. M1242 inquires as to the frequency of the patient's pain and also collects information about whether the pain interferes with movement or activity. In order to answer this question correctly, you must consider the patient's pain at the time of the evaluation as well as the recent pertinent past. Because we need to consider the recent pertinent past as well, we're going to answer this question not only based on observation, but also on interview. We should be asking about the 24-hour cycle of pain 
plus how their pain has been recently. Remember, OASIS questions are only part of a comprehensive assessment of pain. We should also be asking the patient as part of our comprehensive nursing or therapy pain assessment when the pain occurs, where they have pain, what makes it worse, what makes it better, and what activities may be aggravating. Plus, we should be asking if their pain restricts their sleep or if they have made any life modifications to manage their pain. When assessing pain, we need to observe the patient moving. Since we will always need to complete an OASIS walk, this is a great time to observe the patient for any signs of pain, such as limping, wincing, or moving more slowly. You should always observe your patient's ability to complete some of their ADLs, such as donning and doffing clothing when completing skin checks or during lung and heart auscultations. Observing these activities will give you additional insight into any pain the patient may be having. If the patient is restricting or modifying any movement or activity due to pain, then score the patient as having pain. Some examples of restricting movement or activity may include taking longer to complete activities due to pain, such as taking longer to get dressed in the morning, or completing an activity less frequently to avoid pain, such as not going up the stairs more than once a day. Or another example would be requiring additional help or assistance to complete activities, such as sitting on a stool when cooking to avoid pain in the legs when standing. Please do use your clinical judgment if the activity that has been restricted has been restricted for a long duration, and it's no longer reasonable that the patient will regain the ability to complete that activity. For example, perhaps you have a patient who reports they stopped downhill skiing 20 years ago because of knee pain. You would likely not consider this when assessing pain if it's unlikely the patient would ever regain the ability to complete downhill skiing again. When completing your assessment of the patient's pain, you need to consider pain medications. Most patients who are taking pain medications do have pain, and their OASIS score should reflect that. However, if the patient is taking pain medications and reports absolutely no pain, including breakthrough pain, then they should be considered as having a score of no pain or no pain that restricts activity. So let's look one final time at the OASIS question. We are being asked, what is the frequency of pain that interferes with the patient's activity or movement? We are going to complete a comprehensive assessment of the patient's pain, considering not only the time of the visit, but also the recent pertinent past. We're going to observe movement and interview the patient or caregiver. In order for the patient to have no pain, a score of zero, they must have absolutely no pain at the time of the visit plus the recent pertinent past. In order for the patient to score a one, the patient has pain that does not interfere with activity or movement. The patient must have pain that is not stopping them from doing or modifying any activity. These include completing an activity slower, requiring more assistance, using an assistive device, or completing an activity less frequently than they normally would. Scores of two would indicate the patient does have pain, but it's occurring less often than daily. Scores of three indicate the patient has pain daily, but it's not constant. In order to score a four all of the time, the patient must have pain constantly throughout the day and night, and the night pain must restrict the patient's sleeping. Now let's talk about dyspnea. M1400 is the OASIS question that inquires about the patient's experience of dyspnea or noticeable shortness of breath. In order to accurately assess this OASIS question, you must consider the patient's dyspnea at the time of the visit plus the past 24 hours. This will require both observation of the patient while you're in the home as well as interview of the patient to understand if they've had any dyspnea in the past 24 hours. If the patient has made a modification to minimize their dyspnea or shortness of breath, then you will score their level of dyspnea based on the modification. For example, if the patient has dyspnea when they lay flat, so since the recent hospitalization they've been sleeping in a recliner chair, then you will score the patient based on how much dyspnea they have in the recliner chair, not when they're laying flat in the bed. 
This is different from scoring the pain item, where we did not consider modifications when scoring pain. There is specific guidance on how we score dyspnea for patients who are using supplemental oxygen. If the patient is using oxygen continuously, then you will score them based on their use of the oxygen. However, if the patient is ordered to use their oxygen intermittently or they're ordered to use it continuously, but they are not using it continuously, even if it's only for a few minutes a day, then we need to score the patient's level of dyspnea without the oxygen donned. When assessing dyspnea, make sure you are observing the patient completing activities, much like you would with the pain items. You would need to complete an OASIS walk when you assess other OASIS items, so this is a great opportunity to observe for dyspnea as well. You will also be observing some ADLs when you have the patient complete skin checks or when you're completing your heart or lung auscultations. Additionally, when you're interviewing the patient, you should be looking for postures that indicate dyspnea, such as the tripod posture depicted. Since we must interview the patient to score the dyspnea question accurately, you need to ask the patient or caregiver if they have had any shortness of breath in the past 24 hours. We need to consider what activities the patient has completed in the past 24 hours as well. Did they need to go up or down the stairs in the home? Did they take a shower? You will want to ask specifically if they had any shortness of breath when laying in their bed. Remember, oftentimes your patient will not know what information is important to you unless you ask. Don't assume your patient will simply disclose activities that are causing shortness of breath. So let's once again look at the question for dyspnea. If you're scoring this OASIS question at the start of care or resumption of care, you need to make sure that you score their dyspnea before you intervene. Scoring the patient before you provide any intervention or suggestions will allow you to take credit for the successful care that you provided. Also, if your patient is non-ambulatory and therefore cannot complete an OASIS walk, you need to have the patient propel their wheelchair 20 feet or complete bed mobility to properly assess their dys dyspnea. Now, in order for the patient to score a zero, patient is not short of breath, they must not have any dyspnea with any activity in the past 24 hours or at the time of the assessment. A score of one when walking more than 20 feet or climbing stairs will be chosen if the patient has dyspnea with these items. You will be observing the 20 feet of ambulation when you complete your OASIS walk. A score of two with moderate exertion will be chosen if the patient has dyspnea with any of the activities listed or any similar activities. Remember, when you see EG on an OASIS question, it means the items that are listed are examples, not an inclusive list. A score of three with minimal exertion will be chosen if the patient has dyspnea with any of the listed activities or similar activities. Finally, a score of four at rest will be chosen if the patient has dyspnea at all times, including day and night. This presentation has been brought to you by the Clinical Education Department at HCR Home Care. The email that you have been sent includes a quiz that is mandatory for any RN, PT, OT, or speech therapist. If you have any questions about the presentation or feedback on its format, please contact the Clinical Education Department. Have a great day.